to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us for another show. Well, that's assuming that this is another show for you. Perhaps this is the first time. And if it is, uh, we introduce ourselves each show because we have first-time listeners every week. So I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I live right outside of Portland, Oregon. And uh, I have written books. Uh, my most recent book is in the House of Tom Bombadil. I've taught philosophy. I've been a real estate investor and yada, yada, yada. That's enough about me. How about you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired professor of history at Central Connecticut State University, specializing in the Reformation. Uh, I've also done a lot of worldview stuff with Chuck Colson over the last eight years of his life, and I've continued to work in that area. I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview and the Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries. Okay, Tom. I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, uh, ethics, and philosophy. One of the places is at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and another is the University of St. Joseph here in Connecticut. Okay, great. Well, I've been looking forward to this show because I've admired our guest for a long time. I read his book, Heavenly Participation, a few years back, and it made a big impact on me. And uh, he recently spoke at the Touchstone Conference, and uh, I took the uh, took took uh, advantage of being there with him to see if he might be uh, open to coming on the show and talking with us about what he talked about at Touchstone. So, uh, Dr. Hans Borsma, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, maybe some things that you're working on right now that you'd like folks to know about. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, It's a real joy to be with you all. And uh, thank you for having me here. In terms of uh, my, my background, I teach theology um, at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, that's where my wife and I spent the fall semesters. And during that fall semester, I was at the Touchstone Conference in Chicago, so I could drive down. And um, we actually live, we have a residence still in Canada, Langley, British Columbia, um, close to Vancouver, uh, where I taught at Regent College for 14 years before coming to Neshota House four years ago. Um, I, my interests, I don't know, I, I, I'm too, too scattered, really, to focus on anything. Um, as, as you mentioned, join, I... Join I, the club, join the club. <laughs> yeah. I, I did this book, indeed, on heavenly participation. And um, most recently, I wrote a book, uh, Five Things Theologians Wish Biblical Scholars Knew. Um, I, I have a book forthcoming a few months from now on Lex Divina uh, called uh, Pierced by Love. And um, I keep working on a larger project on uh, participation, uh, participatory mm-hmm. metaphysics. And uh, my work on Dionysius, or my talk on Dionysius, I should say, is, uh, is part of that. Well, I was uh, really fascinated with it. Uh, the theme of cosmology is something that's uh, been on my mind. Um, uh, and, of course, you were uh, addressing that subject, but also metaphysics or ontology. Tell us a little bit about what you said at the conference. And uh, I've got a number of notes that, you know, in case you've forgotten, I'll bring up. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. My memory is like a sieve. (laughs) My memory is like a sieve. So I might well, I might well need those notes. Um, But, but I think I remember the basic message. Uh, the, 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 The basic message is that, um, is to address a concern that that people often have about the Middle Ages and about the hierarchy that that, that, um, characterized the Middle Ages and, frankly, the time before the Middle Ages. Um, And and that concern is that of power. Um, So the the, the fear is and the concern is um, if you have a hierarchical understanding of, of, of cosmology, um, don't you end up with an oppressive regime necessarily? Isn't oppression uh, power baked into the system, as it were? Um, and certainly the concern, I think, is a valid concern. Oppressive power is, is, a, is a deeply problematic thing, obviously, at least I think obviously. Um, and um, so what I did in that talk is I turned um, to the person who invented the term hierarchy, <laughs> namely Dionysius, um, late, late um, 6th, early 7th century monk uh, from Syria. And um, I, I, I asked him the question, as it were, uh, what do you think about power? So I read his works, his main works, and looked to see what it is that he does with power. And um, the fascinating thing that showed up is um, that, yes, he does talk a fair bit of, of, of power, 
um, power is an important theme for him. Um, he never talks about power in an oppressive manner, as an oppressive thing. Um, he always talks about power as something that is supposed to lift us up, or as he calls it also, to use his Greek term, uh, to hierarchize us. Um, so yeah, there's a structured, uh, a layered understanding of reality, a vertically layered understanding of, of reality. Um, the purpose of that is not to push down those at the bottom. The purpose is to lift those at the bottom up and to, to assist them to enter into the life of God. So to assist them in deification, you could say. Um, and um, I, I thought that's a fascinating thing because it's the very opposite, in fact, of what we often think hierarchy to do. <laughs> and, and, and what's more, and, and the other thing that I briefly also did in the, in the talk uh, is then to ask, well, how about modernity? How does, it, how does it treat power? What if you don't have hierarchy, but you have a strictly egalitarian understanding of reality? What does that do to your understanding of power? And in my view, at least, what it does actually is, is it, it is in principle, oppressive. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to elaborate, but but that's yeah, the, yeah. the conclusion well, I, I came I, to. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I, I think both those themes are, you know, gr- you know, great to explore. Uh, in terms of uh, Dionysius and his name, um, maybe we ought to explain a little bit about that. Uh, you know, our audience is pretty broad. We've got uh, people with PhDs, but also guys who swing hammers. Sure. And so if you could fill us a little bit on, in on that. Yes, um, Dionysius um, uh, is, is a name that we see in the scriptures in Acts chapter seven, 17. Um, in that chapter, uh, Dionysius is a, is a convert of St. Paul in Athens as he uh, delivers his uh, Areopagus sermon or lecture. And um, Dionysius gets converted. And when, when people um, started reading the person we now often designate as pseudo-Dionysius or simply as Dionysius, when people started reading this guy in the Middle Ages, um, um, they thought, well, he, he must be. He must be the, the Dionysius of Act 17. And that is, in fact, how, how the author more or less portrays, him, uh, portrays himself as the Dionysius of Act 17. That's, that's historically speaking inaccurate. Everybody agrees on that today. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the persona he takes on. It's an interesting thing to do. Uh, today, we might think of it as presumptuous <laughs> to, <Yes. laughs> to like, sort of dress yourself, up, dress yourself up in the persona of a biblical figure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but he might have actually thought of it as as humble. <laughs> yes, it's sort of like you know, I'm going to be invisible and I'm going to put on this persona and uh, not let you know who I really am. That's exactly what he's doing. what he's doing. That is exactly, I think, what he's doing. It's a beautiful thing, I think, because what he's basically trying to channel is is a a Pauline understanding of reality. Um, to be sure, in his case, uh, colored by his own Neoplatonic background, and um, he he puts himself completely in the background. He says, "Well, this is what I think." Uh, the truth of the matter is, and who I am really ultimately doesn't matter, except in the sense that this is what I think the scriptures teach us. Right. Well, we could get into uh, Neoplatonism a little bit and maybe um, think about how, you know, Paul and Neoplatonic thought converge. But instead of kind of jumping into that immediately, why don't we think a little bit about the hierarchy? So there's a hierarchy that you described that was really intriguing and really kind of counterintuitive to the modern way of thinking, as you've noted. Can you can you describe how Dionysius described, you know, sort of thought about it? Um, yeah. So um, w- when we think of hierarchy and the origins of hierarchy and, and who's all part of the hierarchy, we, we often tend to think that the Middle Ages had God at the top. And uh, angels followed, and then human beings, and then maybe animals, trees, rocks, and all the way down. Um, and, and, and the God who's at the top is really an oppressive, nasty figure in our, in our popular imagination. Um, because he's, he's the one who controls the whole thing, and, and uh, we're supposed to do whatever he tells us. Um, so so it's, it's something driven by law, we tend to think, and it's something oppressive. Um, the, the truth of the matter is um, Dionysius has such a high regard for the transcendence of God mm. 
that he doesn't see God as one figure within the hierarchies, not even the top one. God is not part of the hierarchy. He's not one member of the hierarchy. And that's important, I think, to, to, to Dionysius, um, because if God were one member of the hierarchy, then whatever he does, uh, other members of the hierarchy cannot do. And whatever they do, um, God cannot do. They, they crowd each other out, as it were. Um, and 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 um, Dionysius wants a non-competitive relationship. He wants a, to to use a, a controversial theological term, a synergetic relationship. Yeah. Where, 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 right. Yeah. This is actually a theme we return to again and again in the show. This is something that Tom loves to kind of get into. <laughs> it's kind of a favorite theme of his own. But but I guess maybe an image that we could use is that you know uh, remember King of the Hill when you were a kid, you get on top and you push everybody off. There's only only room for one guy at the top. Yes. <laughs> and so God uh, sort of supports himself at the top at our expense. <laughs> That's yes. kind of the way a lot of people think about it. But that's, you're saying that's it's a not great, a great way. That's a great image for, for, for the kind of thing that Dionysius wants to get rid of. Yes. Uh, that's not how he views the relationship between God and the rest of us. God, you know, yes. It, it, it might be good, actually, at this point to talk about the difference between power and authority in Dionysius. I, I found that that part of the conversation or the presentation really illuminating. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I'm sorry. I was sorry to cut you off there, Hans. I, I, I was just, my mind immediately went to Philip Pullman and his Dark Materials series. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, I'm not. But that's, so he's an atheist, kind of a new atheist figure. Uh, and he uh, kind, of, kind of makes a kind of an anti-Narnia story uh, in which uh, God really is the big bully at the top. And um, mm. really thinks of God within the framework of being, right. uh, in other words, just another being among. Sure, I think David David Bentley Hart keeps pointing out that that um, that's the picture that the new atheists essentially work with all of them when they when they talk about God and when they deny God. The God that they deny is a God who's part of the hierarchy, who's, who's one member. Of, of the hierarchy, and it tells us what to do and what not to do. Who has who has ultimate authority? Who, who imposes his will, his voluntas, on us? Um, and, and, and such a god is not not worth worshiping. The new atheists figure, and 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 I think David Hart rightly points out, um, no, indeed, such a god is not worth worshiping, and that's not the Christian God. <laughs> Um, the Christian God, or at least the God that, that Dionysius um, holds out to us, is, is, is a God who lovingly wants to uplift us into his very own being, and into his own goodness, into his own beauty, his own truth. Um, theosis, deification, that's, that's, that's Dionysius. Um, so I'm not, not quite sure, Glenn, uh, about your, your authority power distinction, what I said about, in the, I said about that in the talk. But what, one of the things that maybe, if, if I don't, don't address your question with these comments, let me know. But, but one of the things um, that, that Dionysius um, um, avoids rightly, I think, is, is the notion that God is up there. We're down here. So God is part of the hierarchy at the very top. And God, uh, in, in, some, in, in a straight command kind of way, um, tells us what to do and what not to do. He's the one with ultimate authority, and so with the ultimate voluntas, the ultimate will, and sort of hurls down commands at, at, at a creation that's far away. Notice says Dionysius, God is so transcendent that he can be present to everything that he has made, and that he can be imminent to everything that he has made. So whereas we are sometimes inclined to play off those two against each other, um, God is either transcendent, sovereign, far above us, or he's imminent, uh, one with everything that he has made, so that there's no difference between them. Um, mm -hmm. Pantheism, right? It's, it's one of the two for us often. And Dionysius mm -hmm. says, no, you, 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 a, a proper understanding of, of, of the fact that God is sovereign, a proper understanding of the fact that God is transcendent, means that he is imminent in everything that he has made. For only someone who's completely beyond the hierarchy, not part of it, but completely beyond the hierarchy, um, can also at the same time make himself present everywhere. 
within the hierarchy. One member cannot do that. Like if you think of God at the top of the hierarchy, he may be present to the archangels right underneath him or something like that, but, but not to everything. Mm-hmm. And, and Dionysius says, no, he's present everywhere. Um, right. According to the capacity, of course, you know, a rock has less capacity than a, than a human being. But, but, but nonetheless, God is present to everything. Now, one of the things I think that people, um, when they think about this, uh, fail to kind of connect is, is this idea of transcendence and imminence not being sort of self-canceling. So, 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 you know, it's, you know, like Augustine, uh, I think isn't, is uh, sort of expressing this idea when he says that God is nearer to us than, you know, we are to ourselves, um, in, in, yes. in a very real way. So the distance, you know, is, is, uh, one of, uh, you know, immeasurable distance in the sense God transcends all of creation. But that means that he can also be immediately present to everything in creation. Um, and that's the trick. I think that's the thing that people miss. Either they, as you know, kind of go one direction or the other. Yes. No, I, I think that's right. And it's interesting that you should mention Augustine in this regard, for it's not only not only the East, not only Dionysius and, 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 and theologians in the East following him, though certainly that's there. But it's also it's also in the in the best moments of the West in, in St. Augustine, for example, uh, that transcendence and imminence imply each other that you cannot have the one, at least properly, you cannot have the one without the other. Um, so, yes, uh, St. Augustine, influenced um, uh, by, by the new Platonist tradition, um, Plato, Plotinus especially, um, he's well aware of what Plotinus did in terms of how, how transcendence and immanence relate to one another. Um, and for Augustine, at least, that understanding coheres well with the biblical account. Um, and I think he was right. Yeah. 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 It's uh, a real quick point. It's also, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's arguable that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is very indebted to this line as well. And, of course, he does work specifically on it. And he, he saw um, Pseudo Dionysius as authoritative. Um, and someone to to have to work through very carefully and incorporate into into uh, the theological work he was doing. One of the interesting uh, points there is how indebted he is with this the notion of analogy, analogy of being, participation, um, and and uh, negative and positive language. And I know there are a lot of readings of Aquinas, but all of that yes. stuff seems yeah. to stem from this line. Am I am I right on that? Um, that, that's that's a difficult question, complex question. So, um, um, Aquinas is different, I think, from from Dionysius. I think it's true what you're saying that 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 um, Aquinas has read Dionysius um, very very carefully. Um, he, um, he he quotes Dionysius. Um, um, more often than anyone else, except for the philosopher, quote unquote, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we may all guess who that is. Um, <laughs> but 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 yeah, so he's 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 um, he's influenced by Neoplatonism. Um, but I think he he also puts his own I mean, spin is a negative word, but his own spin on it. Um, mm-hmm. So, so in, in my in my talk for Touchstone, I, I talked about Dionysius' understanding of God as hupousios, beyond being. Yeah, um, you won't find that term that way in 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 Aquinas, Aquinas. Um, and and I think it has to do with the fact that that um, uh, for Aquinas, God is ultimately intelligible. Uh, and, and and whereas for 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 Dionysius he's not. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Aquinas quotes Dionysius repeatedly, and and I think Aquinas aims to uphold a participatory ontology, and especially I mean the last twenty or thirty years, most Aquinas scholars actually really emphasize this this Dionysian side of of of. Aquinas, 
Um, I, I tend to read Aquinas more in a more Aristotelian manner. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when he talks about participation, it's participation in common being, which is mm-hmm. which is a created category. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Dionysius is bolder, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, they, they both want to be high, uh, they both want to be participatory in their thinking. Yeah. Um, uh, but 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 uh, Dionysus is a bit more a bit more feisty about it, I think. <laughs> yeah, you might want to define participatory here because I'm not sure all of our listeners will understand sure. what you mean. Yeah, sorry about that. So so when when I'm talking about participation, like in the title of of my book, Heavenly Participation, I'm talking about participation of earthly things in heavenly realities, um, mm-hmm. or 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 simply put, sharing we. We share when, by, by, our, by virtue of our existence, simply because we, we have being, simply because we're, we're around, as it were, we can do things. Simply by virtue of being, um, by existing, we, we share in God's being. Um, I, think it's worth, I think it's worth noting at this point that this is uh, biblical language. It's not necessarily uh, it's sort of just uh, the language of philosophy or theology. So, you know, 1 Corinthians 10 Paul talks about participating in the in the blood of Christ or the cup the yes. cup and the bread and so forth. So uh, this is not something that we should sort of recoil from, if, if in the sense that well, it doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. <laughs> no, and and I suspect one reason why Dionysius calls himself Dionysius <laughs> has to do with Acts seventeen. In him, in him we live and move and have our being. Right. Um, you know. Um, so yes, it's 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 a biblical thing. Um, we're, we're so influenced by modernity, uh, mm-hmm. which, which, which ha- has tended to treat created realities or material things, as, as moderns typically would put it, um, uh, material things as just their DNA, just their materi- material, material, uh, uh, sensible reality, um, but 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 that would just be inert dead stuff, and and right. and for the Christian view, nothing is just matter. Um, everything that has being has being because because God animates it somehow, and that that animation, um, uh, the the fact that created things are are sacramentally making God present, as it were, that God is really present in them. Um, that's something that. We've more we, we've we've pushed under the carpet, I think, um, in in the modern period. It's something we need to recover. Yeah, I think it, interestingly enough, in, in First Corinthians ten, the word that's translated participation is in participation in the body of Christ is koinonia, which right. is a word yes. that most evangelicals are going to be very familiar with. Yeah, um, <laughs> we translate it fellowship. It's a, a common word that's used to describe marriage as the most intimate relationship possible between people. You know, that's what that's what this kind of participation is talking about. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, it, it's it, that's a category that evangelicals have for dealing with each other, but they don't have for dealing with God so much, I don't think. <laughs> yes, right. I think that's true. Um, there, there are basically two two terms, two, two broad terms, at least for for participation. The or Methusia on the one hand and Koinonia on the other hand. Um Sometimes theologians, you know, when they, when they don't like the Dionysian approach, they'll say, well, you know, the Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, talks about koinonia, but the Bible doesn't talk about Methaxis. Mm. Um, and, and, and so we can, we can sort of push it away. Um, um, that, that's not entirely true in the first place, but if, if, let's assume it is, it is true for, for a moment. Um, when when the the early fathers talk about participation, they 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 switch back and forth between methexis language and koinonia language. Um, they're they're willing to use either of those two terms freely, and if and when they do make a distinction, sometimes they do. Um, then then the term koinonia is the more intimate of the two. Right. Interesting, like I think what you're, what you're alluding to, Glenn, right? Like koinonia, that we participate in the body and blood of our Lord, 
uh, doesn't keep us separate from the body and blood of our Lord. It, it makes us into the body of Christ. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and that, that means something ontologically is at stake, not just the relation between two separate entities. No, they, they interpenetrate perichoretically, like they're, they're connected, they're linked. Right. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, modern Christians uh, deal with without realizing that, that it's the case is that, uh, that when they approach the scriptures with kind of the modern lenses on, um, they assume that they're reading the Bible the same way people in the first century did. They, they don't realize that there's a kind of filtering process going on. So one of the ways I try to illustrate this with people is I, so I try to help them see that their idea of eternal life is that, that it, God gives you this eternal life cookie and you bite it and you get to live forever. It's like, it's like suddenly you're made of plastic, you know, you're indestructible. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but whereas the older view or the, the, the biblical view is that you are in Christ and Christ in God and that the life that is there is communicated to you. So it's a package deal. You know, you don't get eternal life without God. Um, it, but I almost think that people think that you do uh, kind of in the modern way of sort of interpreting things like eternal life is, is a gift in the sense that it's an objective thing that God that's separate from God that just kind of like, yes. you know, go, go on your way. Don't bother me. Yes. Yes. I, I love the imagery that you're giving there, um, and, and the reason for for my loving it is is that it it brings to the fore um, uh, a, a a view of of the hereafter of the eschaton that that um, has has changed drastically I think over the centuries, not for the bad for the better again, mm-hmm. um, and it has to do with with our cookie approach um, to to salvation. Um, okay, here's your here's your cookie. Like you're saying, go on your way, and and there's the door. Walk on in and see how much you can enjoy over there. Um, but but what that does, what that does, is it views the stuff beyond the door as as being of the same kind as the stuff in front of the door. Um, but but on on the biblical view, I think, and on the view of the earlier tradition. That is not so. Um, some, some, some uh, a, a drastic transfiguration takes place, both bodily and intellectually, uh, of 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 all of, of every creature that goes through the door, as it were, uh, mm-hmm. so so that they can be made fit to be there. And the fittingness has to do with, like you're saying, our union with God. It, it, it has to do with with being able to see God, beatific vision. Um, it's not like we're going to be there. You know, I'm, I'm Dutch. I, I, I love Heineken beer. I mean, it's not like we're going to be drinking beer in the pub there. Uh, it's, not? It's, it's, no, it's not even it's not even Bach cantatas that we're going to be listening to. Um, it, it, well, it's it's entering, like St. Gregory of Nessa would put it, entering ever more deeply into the life of God. Um, our, our eschatology, our view of the end times, must be God-centered and, and cannot be just more of the same. Um, yeah, I think one of the more, uh, I, you know, the, of course, the challenge with this is communicating this to people. Yes. Uh, I think C.S. Lewis does a marvelous job in two of his works, the very end of the Chronicles of Narnia, higher up, you know, further and higher up, or I can't remember how it's put. But then also uh, in The Great Divorce, you know, that that you're entering into a, something that's more real. And we have this t- sense that yes. somehow what we're describing is less real. Exactly. Yeah, but what we're, we're getting into something that's more real. But, of course, you have to use the stuff of this world to communicate that. That's the trick. Um, and yes. in, the, in the process, you can end up maybe giving people, maybe who, who maybe are literally are, are, are just too literal-minded, uh, the idea that we really are going to sit on clouds with harps and things. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, that's possible. But, but you know, I, I always get – so so the harps, you know – Three times. <laughs> Three times. So where did test- that come from? <laughs> <laughs> right. Where did it come from? It's, it's the scriptures themselves who give it to us, the, the, the metaphor. 
three times yeah. in the book of Revelation. Uh, uh, so so, so the, the common, you know, neo-evangelical slash, slash Calvinist um, um, uh, polemic against playing harps on the clouds um, <laughs> is, is, is really a, a misunderstanding of, of what, what the harps do in in the book of Revelation, um, and and what if, what all these other images too of of the New Jerusalem, what they do in in the book of Revelation, they're not literal description. I mean, there isn't anyone in the Christian tradition who thinks that we'll be playing harps on clouds in the year after. Not one. <laughs> it's 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 just that that the author that 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 the the prophet the seer. Um, is is reaching for the for the grandest picture yeah. possible to to convey how how somehow how magnificent um, this new reality is is going to be. Uh, so so when 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 C.S. Lewis says you know the hev- heaven is more real, mm-hmm. um, he's not thinking it's denser. Or I mean some some of his pictures may give an impression. Perhaps I'll acknowledge that, but right. but. <laughs> But but I think he I mean he's a new he's a, he's a Platonist he's a Christian Platonist so he's thinking of of the cave in the background you know the Platonic cave when you're in the cave that's not really real but when you're out of the cave and, and the light that's when things become truly real they're really real that's what he has in mind so when he's thinking you know it, it's more real heaven is more real he's thinking of of something that is cannot be reduced to time and space the way we have time and space here because we're in the presence of God. Um, and that therefore has to be more real. Sorry. Yeah, I think one of the things about Lewis that uh, is intriguing to me, because I write fiction, uh, is the, uh, the aspiration that many evangelicals have to be C.S. Lewis or the next C.S. Lewis. But they lack the most important ingredient, which is his metaphysics. Right. <laughs> they have no That's clue great. how his metaphysics work. They just think yes. he's a marvelously imaginative person, and they don't have any. But it's not as though Lewis disguises what he's up to. He gives you clues all over the place. All over the place. <laughs> yeah. It's all in Plato. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, right. Well, and, and, and fascinatingly, I mean, I think part of the the richness of, of that participatory and um, that sharing in uh, God's life and the way we're constituted as creatures that find our, our fullness and fulfillment in, in that, in, in the beatific vision, um, is it doesn't just place what we are as humans, you know, it's simply as, you know, what we've been defined at creation, you know, the or origin, nor nor just, you know, the, you know, um, the process, but but that towards which we are oriented in the fullness of our createdness. Um, and I think that couple, I mean, that spreads itself out to the whole of creation, oriented to that, you know, so so that it becomes a theophanic, maybe a good word, um, and it is that beauty that allows us somehow to touch the, the joy that God's own life is. And I think that joy element, um, the, f- the fullness of it in, in this face-to-face with God, something I think Lewis did get a little of, but I think it's so underplayed in Western theology. Um, and, and I think the stuff you're talking about, especially with sacramental ontology and the like, I think it's, it's recapturing some of that. Yeah, I, I, I try to. Um, you talk about joy. I just finished writing a sermon, um, and 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 one of the the, the, the lectionary um, deals with with Deuteronomy twenty six, and 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 there you have the wandering Aramean creed. You know, my father was a wandering Aramean, talking about Jacob there, and um, then 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 God says, "I gave you X, I gave you Y, I gave you Z or Z." Sorry, Americans. Um, you know, I, I gave you. I gave, six times you have six times you have the the verb give Natan, and 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 then then you're supposed to come to Jerusalem because God gives you all these things, and 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 then you bring the first fruits you give them back to God, and then it says you shall rejoice, uh, <laughs> you and 
And like, it's a command, like you shall rejoice, you know? <laughs> and, it's like when and, I was and, a, like, when my kids were small, I'd talk about mandatory fun. It's mandatory fun time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you shall, thou shalt rejoice. You know, the first commandment. I mean, it's, and, and when I started looking at this, I mean, it's all over the scriptures, you know, the, the command to rejoice. rejoice. Um, you read Psalm 100, the famous Psalm 100. I mean, rejoice, come with thanksgiving and a new song before God. It just goes on and on over this in the scriptures. Joy isn't just, you know, this, this, this feeling that bubbles up and disappears or whatever. No, it is, um, it, 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 is, it is us giving back to God what he has brought to us. So everything comes down, es- uh, cascading from, from, from God's being. And, and, and we bring it back, offer it back to him, the return to God. Um, and, and and that's what joy is. I think that's what what Eucharist is, and Thanksgiving. You know. So one of the things yeah. I'm thinking a little bit about here is how we help people kind of uh, uh, enter into this way of thinking. So, so you know, your background is in the Reformed tradition, um, and um, and you're from the Netherlands. Um, I just start, started a, a book study with my men at my church. Uh, with Kuiper's uh, lectures on Calvinism last night. So um, one of the things that, you know, he, he makes, uh, you know, he stresses in that is, uh, and we could talk about that if you want to, but we don't have to, but one of the things he stresses in there is the immediacy of yeah. uh, the Holy Spirit to all the saints, you know, uh, and it seems to me that this is sort of what we're getting at with pseudo-Dionysus with respect to the hierarchy. In other words, God being immediately present to every every uh, yeah. part of it. Yeah, I, I think there's truth to that, which is fascinating to me. So Kuiper is an interesting guy, Abram Kuiper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Kuiperian tradition, the neo-Calvinist tradition, isn't known in general for its love of Plato, right? They, 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 there's a lot of anti-Plato talk in 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 the neo-Calvinist tradition, in the Kuiperian tradition. Um, but there's another side to Kuiper. Um, some time ago, I, I, I started um, looking at what Kuiper says about the beatific vision, about seeing God in the hereafter. And, and then, um, Tom, what you're talking about, this immediacy of, of God's relationship with us comes to the fore. Every morning, he wrote a meditation. He got up really early, Abram Kuiper, every day. He had, he had a very strict regimen. Um, that's, so, that's the only way he could be as productive as he was, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and so every, he, start, he started every morning by writing a meditation uh, for, for the newspaper that he had started. He started his own newspaper. And, um, and, and those meditations, uh, they're published in, in a whole bunch of books. I, I forget how many. I think six different, different little volumes. They're beautiful little volumes. And, and there you see a side of Kuiper that's very mystical. Uh, very personal. Um, the, he's almost like a pietist there, you, you would think, you know. And I, I don't think it extends, I don't want to overdo this. I don't think it makes him, a, you know, a, a neoplatonist of sorts. Um, and you might say perhaps even that there's a tension between, you know, this, this transforming vision Kuiper and this mystical Kuiper. Uh, yeah. and, and I won't deny it that there is that tension. But but yeah, he, he he has this real mystical side, um, and uh, it, it's a mysticism that I, I I think he took from from one of the people, or especially his older lady that that converted him, um, yeah. through whom he was converted, um, and and it's a mysticism that you see in certain forms of the Reformed tradition, um, uh, in, in certain in certain pietistic forms of the Reformed tradition. You see it in Puritanism too. I think it's worth worth noting here that mystery is a biblical word. Uh, yes. I think that you know that sometimes people associate that term with a kind of uh, ascetic tradition that makes a lot of folks uncomfortable um, yes. in, the, in the, the evangelical world. But the word, you know, uh, is uh, not what I think people associate with it. Um, right. You know, when we when we hear the term mystery used in Scripture, uh, it's not uh, even like what we think of with like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. It's, it's right. not a puzzle to be not solved, not a puzzle, you know, yes, but a reality to be encountered within something else. 
to yes. or revealed through something else. That's helpful, I think. Um, yeah, sometimes, indeed, when we when, when we think about the word mystery, mysterion, um, in, in Greek, and, and Paul's use of it, we, we apply our, our notion of puzzle to that <laughs> term. And so when, when, when the apostle says, um, you know, that, that the mystery that's been hidden for ages has now been revealed, we, we apply our puzzle theology, as it were, <laughs> and we say, so yeah, there was this, this weird thing we didn't get back then. <laughs> but, now, but now that that, that Christ has come, we get it, we comprehend it, the puzzle, the pieces of the puzzle fit together. No, actually, because what, what, <laughs> Paul, what Paul instead is after is, is, is that, that when, when Christ comes, when, when God becomes incarnate, let's put it that way, when God becomes incarnate, um, we enter into this mystery of God. Um, right. That, right. And, and that, I think, is something quite different. <laughs> Oh, I agree. I think, I think, go, go ahead, Glenn. What, what's interesting is that that is exactly what you find if you read Calvin. You know, Calvin talks in terms of mystical union with Christ. Yes, he says that absolutely. as long as Christ is outside of us, none of his benefits can apply to us. It's only when we, we, are, we enter in, when we participate in Christ, when we, that we have this union, that's the means through which his righteousness is passed to us and overwhelms our sin. Um, Union with Christ is huge for Calvin, right? Right. Yes, yeah. and 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 justification and sanctification simply follow from the union. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is maybe one of the things that should be talked about more: how the different theological th- threads or or uh, kind of come together. So, like you noted, some people would place, say, pseudo Dionysius and John Calvin at opposite extremes. Yeah. When in fact, maybe they're on the opposite side of the world talking to each other. <laughs> They've gone so far yeah. in these different directions that they actually come together on the other side. <laughs> I, I like the way you talk about that, is how they come, how the opposite ends reach each other. Um, I, I think we shouldn't overdo the similarity between Calvin and uh, between Dionysius and Calvin. Um, because um, well, Kelvin talks about union with Christ a great deal, and, and, and this has to do with koinonia and so on, fellowship. Um, um, that's, not necess- that's not the same thing as talking about all of creation participating in the being of God. So, so for Kelvin, it's, it's a soteriological thing. It has to do with our salvation. Um, and and he he will talk about about creation as being the theater of God's glory, for, or you know, using language like that. Um, unlike Dionysius, he, he will not use use the strong participatory language of 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 sharing in the being of God. Um, he, there, there's one, and yeah, so 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 the the, the underlying metaphysic, I think, is somewhat different to my mind. It has to do with with late medieval developments, um, where, where where heaven and earth increasingly are, are separated. Um, I, I think you see some of that in Calvin. It's not it, like Glenn says, yeah, but there's union with Christ. So it's it's not simply like it's not present in Calvin. It's just that I think increasingly with the Reformation period, these sort of categories of fellowship, participation, and so on, move to the move. To the realm of salvation, and 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 the, the the larger metaphysic, I think, slowly but surely changes. Not to overdo the change, but I think there is a change that's, that's taking place. Yeah, I think that you know what we see in say Romans eight with creations, uh, sort of uh, an eager sort of anticipation of. We see your cat there, by the way, Hans, and, and it's, that's okay. We've got cats. It's my dog. I'll, I'll show you my dog so that everybody knows that it's a dog here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. He's she a, wants he's a good to boy. play. Welcome she friend. wants to play. <laughs> is it a she or a he? It is a she. Yeah, no, she's a good dog. She wants to play. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, I guess another thought, something that I've been spending a lot of time uh, kind of reflecting on, and we talked a little bit about this with Michael Hamby, is the nature of knowledge and how that plays into this. So 
knowledge is power, the Baconian kind of thing, um, instrumentalizes yeah. everything. And there's a loss of, um, well, what, you know, Joseph Pieper was getting at when he was uh, reflecting on leisure and, you know, the book leisure as the basis right. of the culture. Um, so there's, there's different ways in which, um, you know, our, our faculties uh, for, to, for, with, with regard to reason uh, are employed, you know, there's ratio and then there's uh, intellectus and that right. kind of thing. But with regard to like what we're talking about here, you know, I think one of the things that's a little off putting for people from the West, when we think about the East is that, is that we come up against this, this uh, kind of, uh, uh, s- sort of uh, huge, sort of uh, unknowable, uh, sort of uh, cloud of uh, unknowing, or whatever, yeah. however you want to put it. Yes. Where where we kind of are lost, uh, we just kind of like lose uh, touch with anything. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that in, ter- in terms of is there a way? You know, in the West, we want to think about something, <laughs> yes. not just empty our minds, you know. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the East, yeah. you do seem to have more of that kind of just sort of like, well, you know, God is beyond our yeah. ability to yeah. ever conceive. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah. On that? Yes. Um, first, I mean, you mentioned the cloud of unknowing, uh, which, of course, is Western. So, so the, the, the good news, I, I suppose, is that it's not absent from the West. It, it, there is a mystical tradition. That, that runs through 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 the West as well, and and it's a tradition that's always invariably, you know, shaped by Dionysius. Then, <laughs> when you when you see it, it's always Dionysius in the background. Um, I think. Uh, I, I, sorry, okay, I think uh, Dennis Turner wrote a book on that some years back. Is that correct? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it, it, it's on, on the apophatic of in, in the Western tradition, especially. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, can't think of the title now, but yes. Um, um, that said, I think I think you're quite right overall. That that what, as Westerners, we're, we're, we we want the quote unquote the picture, and the East is more comfortable uh, with negative theology, with with unsaying things, with denying things, um, and and. Um, that's why, uh, let me say two things about that. One is, that is why the East um, and, and Dionysius in particular, uh, taking, taking his cue from, from uh, Plotinus and Proclus, w- why he uses this Hooper language, this beyond language. God is, God is beyond being, Hooper usios, beyond good, beyond even the one. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so, th- so God is absolutely transcendent. Um, um, at the same time, so that, that's, I mean, and you don't see that in the West as nearly as much. Um, that said, um, when, when, when um, Dionysius writes his mystical theology, he, he, he begins it with a, a, a encomium, a word of praise on, on the triune God who is that Huperusios. And, and often, I am trying to think now. I think it's in the divine names. Um, often he will talk about my Jesus, um, mm-hmm. and 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 it, like it's, it's almost like he's a pietist, and he's talking not just not about not about you know first Palestine Jesus. He's talking about the Huprusios Jesus, the beyond mm-hmm. being Jesus. So so he it, what I'm trying to say is he knows, and it's not just Dionysius who does it. I've, I've noticed it elsewhere too. But but definitely it's in Dionysius. He knows that that when we talk about not talking, <laughs> you know, about negative language, um, we, we we cannot move beyond the very heart of what the Christian tradition gives us: the the uh, faith in the Triune God, faith in the Incarnate Lord. Um, so so but but. The point, I think, is, and that's the, 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 the beauty, I think, of Dionysius, the, the point is that, that the love of God in Jesus is never exhausted. Hmm. Um, it's never comprehended. We don't comprehend God's love in Jesus. We don't comprehend, when we say Trinity, 
And we're talking, yeah, relations. You know, the son proceeds from the father, the spirit proceeds. You know, we don't really know what we are talking about. Um, yeah, there's an analogous language there that we use, and, 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 and the scriptures rightly give us those language, obviously. It's just that the, the reality of it far exceeds our comprehension. Um, and, and, and one reason why I really like the Eastern tradition is, is that it reminds us that, that, that we, we can never, we will never comprehend the being of God. Um, mm-hmm. the, the God's love in Jesus always outshines our comprehension forever. Um, and and um, I, th- I think that's a good reminder. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's in part what Lewis is expressing with that end of Tenarnia, the idea that, you know, it keeps getting better as right. you go further in. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. It's, it's like he's been reading Gregory of Nyssa. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's true. I, I think um, a, a quick question uh, related back to, of course, the the other side of it, in, in the, the where you often will talk um, – I remember I remember assigning your book on Nouvelle Theology to my contemporary theology class and get, getting shrieks. But I thought it was so important for them to know those those debates. They thought they were kind of irrelevant, and I think they were very central. But the the significance of of this notion of this development of pure nature, or you've used the term pure history, um, which which um, is 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 something that kind of floods through both the theology and the assumptions of contemporary West. Uh, what, yes. what do you mean by that? And, and maybe some like Deleuze and, and some of the other figures, because I know that's significant to your work. Yeah. Well, the notion of pure nature, uh, pura natura in, in, in Latin, um, was, was first used in the 17th century. And I think that's, that's illustrative of, of, of the fact that the, in the 17th century, especially some major metaphysical changes are, are, are taking place. And, and when, when theologians begin using that term, um, they, they are beginning to inhabit a modern world, you could say. Mm-hmm. A modern world in which nature is purely that. It's, it's mm-hmm. just, just the sensible realities that you see around us. That with the five senses you access, um, and 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 it, it's a world from which you have bracketed off, from which you've you've excluded um, the telos, the aim, which is supernatural, which is supernatural. Um, yeah, the, yeah. the the aim of all of creation, as you pointed out earlier, Tom, the, the aim of all of creation, uh, Romans eight, right, is 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 is, is God. So so. Nature is never, never separate from from the final cause, to put it in Aristotelian terms. Never separate from from that which draws us, namely, or, or the one who draws us, namely God Himself. Um, so, so, so the way that the world is made, the form, as it were, of created things, um, is, is 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 shaped with a view to that supernatural end. So, so it's never purely natural. Uh, grace is always already there. Um, God is already at work before we're even starting. Um, so what do you think was the cause of this shift in the 17th century? Uh, is it uh, just unpacking some things that happened earlier with um, nominalism, or is there something, something else going on? Right. So, so I, 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 the, the, the root causes metaphysically are indeed in the late, Middle Ages, I think, with nominalism. Uh, once, once you say that that created things don't participate in something greater, um, you've cut the link between heaven and earth, so that so that so that those Platonic forms uh, or ideas uh, aren't, aren't real. Um, there's names, nomina, nominalism. There's mm-hmm. names. So you know, we we can we can give a name to created things, but that's just a subjective imposition upon those things that's the way we moderns tend to look at things right. that that metaphysically indeed gets 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 started in in the late middle ages um but i think i and and i think um after that the reformation develops this 
um, with uh, with give and take, to be sure. I mean, I, I, a friend of mine wrote a dissertation on, on Peter Martyr Vermigli, and uh, she she makes the point in her dissertation that that actually that, 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 that it's not just nominalism in Peter Martyr Vermigli. There's also a lot of Platonic participatory elements in its in its theology. So I think the Reformation is an in-between stage. I think that's true. And I, I was probably too too one-sidedly critical in my book, Heavenly Participation. It's, it's, it's a both end in the Reformation, I think. Um, but the 17th century is crucial um, because the new science, um, the Baconian science, I mean, Francis Bacon explicitly and deliberately uh, uh, professes to be a nominalist and insists that when it comes to empirical observation, we must exclude all ends, all telloi, all, all, all purposes from the equation, from, from our empirical endeavors. So you go, by, you go strictly by observation. So you live, um, even if you're, if you're still a Christian, a, a Christian scientist, for example, um, you're, you're methodologically an atheist. Right. So, so in, in biblical studies, there's often the question, you know, should should we should we um, be methodological naturalists, right? Should we historically read the Bible uh, apart from any sort of supernatural influence, like miracles or, or divine inspiration or divine providence or, or any such theological notions? Should we just do it historically? Should we be just historians? Well, you, when you hear the word "just." You can fill in instead pure or pure. You know, should we just do history, pure history? I, I, I think it's a betrayal of the Christian faith, honestly. When you when you when you want to do methodological naturalism in biblical studies, I think it's a betrayal of faith. Um, and and when it comes to the new science of of the 17th century, that's where you see this 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 naturalism um, coming to the fore. Rather blatantly, I think, and and and, and explicitly, um, and and so Christian the, the Christian uh, Christian scientists and Christians in general in other areas too, biblical studies and elsewhere, begin to retreat. I think, or at least begin to retreat from 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 seeing and treating um, God's God's creation as exactly that God's creation. You know, I. I... I think that we we really see this come to its fruition. I have no doubt that it's dating back to Bacon, but I think we really see its fruition only when you start getting to the 19th century. Um, if you look at the transactions of the Royal Philosophical Society in the late 18th century, you'll, which was the premier, what we would describe as scientific organization in the world, you'll find these uh, studies of science you know, scientific studies on things. And in the conclusions, you'll find spiritual and moral lessons that are drawn from them. Right. Interesting because, stuff, right? Because, because they're <laughs> operating in the context of natural philosophy, not what sure. we call natural science. Sure. But it takes a couple of hundred years to, to for the trends you're talking about to really reach fruition. I think that's true. So you get, you, you get runkers, you know, wie es eigentlich gewesen war, the way things actually happen. And then, like you're saying, you, you're going to add, add an application to it. It's sort of the, the, the good biblical scholar who first does his exegesis, and then does his application, right, as, as a later step. Right. right. Um, and, and I think you're right. And it's the same in biblical scholarship, but especially happens in the 19th century. True. Yeah. My daughter just got her PhD in theology, biblical studies from Notre Dame. And it okay. always drove her crazy because she was saying, all these guys are saying, should we treat this as a theological text or a historical text? Why not both? Yes. <laughs> right. Well, you, you yeah. address this uh, in your in another one of your books. Uh, I think it's a sacramental preaching, if I remember correctly. The idea that, you know, so I, I this idea that, you know, you've got, okay, this sort of technical thing you've just done, which is exegesis, and now you've got an application. Yes. It really, really puts the pastor in in, a, in the driver's seat in ways that I don't think uh, are healthy for him or the congregation. <laughs> but right. uh, uh, when when, you, when, <laughs> when the goal is to uh, sort of help people enter into the text and help the text enter into them, yeah. uh, 
then it's not so much, okay, this is what I think you ought to do, folks. Although there can be some of that. I mean, uh, but it's more, uh, there's God at work in you through his word. uh, And that's what this is all about. Uh, I love the way that you put that, you know, putting the, putting the preacher in the driver's seat. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So yeah, because the preacher gets to say whatever he wants. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the preacher will measure the success of his message based on whether or not people did exactly what he told them to do. Yes, <laughs> yes. So there, there's a moralism implied there often. Yeah. They, you know, in the best preachers, that's not necessarily so. They, they will check themselves. But, but it, it certainly opens that up. Um, whereas, whereas um, if, if the scriptures always already contain Jesus Christ, all of the scriptures, not just the New Testament, but if they already are the sacramental, um, the sacramental gift that contains the truth of Christ, if, if that's what the scriptures are, um, then, then, then as a preacher, you, you put yourself at the disposal of the Spirit and you search the scriptures to see what they say about Christ. Um, and, and, and that's what you bring, bring to the fore. Um, so you're, you're merely a medium as it were, a sacramental medium as, as a preacher to, 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 um, to dig, dig up the treasure from, from the ground and to, to for, and, and to see what's there. Um, and, and you also have the possibility of people getting some things out of your sermon that you don't even remember having said, you know, we, we, we all know this, <laughs> this experience as, as preachers where you, you have somebody come to you years later and say, that sermon changed my life. And, I, and then you say, well, what did I say? And then they tell you, yes. and you think, I never said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. Actually, though, even backing up a step further, if Paul were a seminary student doing an exegesis paper, he'd be failed for the book of Galatians. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Right, right. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, th- th- this is this is what you're talking about, r- reading the scripture christologically. That's a great and point you, you make. I, I, and I think, frankly, verboten. you wouldn't just. Sorry. Yeah, no, it, it's just verboten. You you you've got to do it using historical, grammatical, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, he, he would fail not just in Galatians. I think he would fail in every every <laughs> epistle he's written. Um, because right. because whatever he does. I mean, most most biblical scholars, you know, they don't talk about Pauline exegesis anymore. They talk about the New Testament's use of the Old Testament, and I think they do that because they 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 are kind of they kind of know that Paul would have failed the test. He doesn't <laughs> yeah. do exegesis, not not at least exegesis the way they understand exegesis. Um, yeah. What he does is is exegesis the way the way exegesis ought to be done, and that is to say, yeah. it's a spiritual reading of the scriptures. Yeah. Right, right. Anyway. Which, which is something that would get you, you know, um, in trouble, as we already noted in many evangelical uh, seminaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in an interesting, an interesting tie to that is it's also very similar to the way we often, from where we are, read negatively the way the church fathers read scripture when they are in much stronger continuity to that approach. I remember Lewis Ayer's famous work on um, night retrieving Nicaea, or I can't remember the title. But one of the things he was saying is if you want to embrace what your confessions say about, you know, the creeds say about conf- confessing the Trinity and the Incarnation, you can't just jettison the exegetical approach they used. And he has this exactly. great chapter on, on the way Hegel came in much later and changed the theological culture that underwrites a lot of our modern dogmatic and, and the exegesis today. So that was very eye opening and I think yeah. really places the work you do as well. Yeah, you, you cannot have Nicaea without, without having the, the, the mode of reading the scriptures that the fathers had, because it's that mode of, that spiritual mode of reading scripture that gave us Nicaea, uh, and that gave us, gave, it gave us the other, other church councils. Um, and, and for the church fathers, they intended nothing else but to read scripture the way that the New Testament read the scriptures, the way that, the, that Paul read the Old Testament. Um, and, and the question is, why wouldn't we do the same? Yeah, that's a great that's a great place to stop. We, we've come to the end of uh, our time, and, but that's a great question. And you know, uh, conversely, it'd be a real shock for many of our uh, evangelical brothers to know they've been more influenced by Hegel than by 
uh, the church fathers. <laughs> 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 anyway, it, thank you for for being with us today. This was a this was a fun conversation, and I I, I think it uh, will be a great help to some some of our listeners out there. But it's a great for, conversation for, indeed, a lot of fun, and I hope it's helpful. Thank yeah, you for having yeah, me. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, I, Go ahead. I, I, I just like to throw in, I am very excited to hear that you're doing a book on Lectio Divina. Yeah, yeah, um, that's great. That, that's been a practice that uh, that has just meant a whole lot to me, and I'm really uh, anxious and looking forward to seeing uh, what you have to say about it. I, I, uh, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> well, great stuff. Thank you. Well, uh, listeners uh, who've gotten all the way to the end of this episode, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast, uh, and uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, we have a number of people who give to the show on a regular basis through our Patreon account, and that's really helpful because there are costs that we incur uh, with every episode. So thank you for doing that. If you'd like to, to, to support the show, uh, you're welcome to do that. It would be really appreciated. And there's a link in the show notes to our Patreon page. Um, we'll also put uh, a link in the show notes to some things that uh, Dr. Borsma has written. And uh, we encourage you to, to check that, uh, his publications out and, and buy his books. Is there any place in particular where you'd like people to go to look to, to learn more about your, your work, Dr. Borsma? Um, they, they could look to my website, uh, which is hansborsma.org. Okay, great. Well, anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks a lot, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Blessings to you all.